This is the first of two films about the human skeleton. What are the functions of the skeleton? What are our various bones for? Well, for one thing, the skeleton supports our bodies. We're vertebrates, animals with internal skeletons. Without a skeleton, this would happen. But our bones have many other uses. They act as levers. All the movements we make depend upon the actions of our bone levers in our arms, our legs, our hands and our feet. All movements, not just graceful movements such as these ballet students are making as they exercise, Every movement we make, great or small, involves the movement of one or more of our bones at a joint. Let's look at the bone movement at one of our simplest joints, in the arm at the elbow. If we use x-rays, we can see the single bone of the upper arm, the humerus, on the right, and the two bones of the forearm, the radius and the ulna, on the left, pivoting at the elbow joint. Here they are on the skeleton, the humerus, and the radius and ulna. What makes them move when we decide to flex our arm? Watch how the arm of this excavator pivots. It's moved by the piston, which shortens or lengthens, to bend the metal arms. we have muscles to perform the same kind of action. On the left, the biceps muscle, when it receives a signal down the nerve from the brain, contracts, shortens, while the triceps on the right relaxes, lengthens, and the arm bends. To straighten the arm again, nerve impulses order the biceps to relax, lengthen, and the triceps to contract like that. There are always muscles working in opposition, one contracting while another relaxes, so that we get nicely balanced movement. Muscles attached by tendons to the bones move our bone levers, contracting or relaxing, to cause the movements we intend to make. A more complicated joint, the knee. This is a model. There are muscles attached to the thigh bone or femur at the top and through tendons to the bones of the lower leg, the tibia and fibula. This is the kneecap to which the tendons are joined. The ends of the bones, covered with smooth cartilage, are enclosed in a capsule filled with fluid, and the whole joint is strengthened by ligaments, the brown straps on the model. Ligaments again, and that capsule, filled with fluid, inside which the bone ends pivot against each other. This is a very complicated joint, and it's very easily damaged. When we bend the knee, nerve impulses cause muscles in the thigh, which are connected by tendons to the lower leg, to contract or relax, so that the levers pivot at the knee joint. The muscles are here, and they're connected by tendons to the bones of the lower leg. If we could look beneath the skin, this is what we'd see. The kneecap and the muscles attached to the thigh bone higher up. Tendons attached to the thigh muscles and kneecap connect these muscles to the bones in the lower leg, where there are other muscles in the calf which bring about movement in the feet. You can see the kneecap moving as the leg is bent and straightened again.
Our muscles aren't just used when we're moving about. Even when we're standing still, they're still working, one set pulling against another to keep us from folding up at the joints. Sometimes joints become damaged through disease or injury. Artificial joints can sometimes be fitted. This is a synthetic knee joint. It's much simpler than the real thing and doesn't allow the same freedom of movement, but it can help people whose real knee joints have become useless. In these x-ray pictures, you can see the artificial joint fixed to the thigh bone, the femur, at the top, and to the tibia in the bottom part of the leg below. This is a much simpler ball and socket joint where the top of the femur fits into the pelvis. It allows movements like these. This joint can become damaged, particularly in elderly people, and an artificial joint can be implanted which is practically as good as the real thing. This one's a metal ball fitting into a plastic cup. Here's the pelvis, and two hip joints have been replaced. The ball is pegged into the femur, and the cup fixed into the pelvis. And the same at the other side. This person will be able to move about quite normally. skeleton again. There are muscles clothing the skeleton. Here, along the spinal column, across the front of the abdomen, in the neck, here, and across the rib cage. If we are to keep a correct posture and use our bodies as efficiently as possible, all these muscles must be kept in trim, and especially the spine must be kept under control at all times. These ballet students must have perfect control of their bodies. They must be sure that their spines are always firmly controlled by their muscles. The ballet teacher helps. control of the posture, the way we hold ourselves, is important for all of us, even if we're not going to be dancers. Let's look at this model of the human spine. There are discs, here they're made of plastic, between the vertebrae. 
In the living body, they're flexible and hollow, filled with a fluid, and they both allow the spine to bend and twist, and also act as shock absorbers. The yellow projections represent nerve fibers, branching off from the spinal cord, which runs inside the spine. The neck is particularly flexible. It's possible, using a new technique, to see the discs between the vertebrae of the living spine, using high-frequency radio waves in a very powerful magnetic field. The waves are beamed through the body from different angles and affect hydrogen atoms in some of the big molecules which make up parts of the body, causing them to emit radio waves which can be detected and measured. From these signals, a computer constructs pictures. This is called scanning using nuclear magnetic resonance. Complicated in theory, but it gives superb pictures of parts of the body. There's the spine. And in between the vertebrae, the discs. There's the front of his body and the back. Horses, like us, are vertebrates. They have a supporting skeleton which corresponds in many ways to ours. But the horse's spine, like that of all quadrupeds, isn't upright because it moves on all four limbs. We are upright animals, and this has certain disadvantages as far as our spines are concerned, as we'll see in the next film. But standing upright means that our hands are free, and this has enabled us to become the most capable of all animals because of the many different ways in which we've been able to learn to use our hands. Just look at some of the things our hands can do. We, the most intelligent of animals, are able to exercise our intelligence through the use of our hands and to accomplish an enormous variety of things which no four-footed creature could equal. We have changed the world around us, creating new environments to suit our ever more complicated ways of life. All this has been possible because of our powerful intelligence developed to serve our hands, free to carry out all kinds of tasks because we walk upright. Because of our intelligence, too, we have come to understand many things about the workings of our bodies, including the ways in which skeleton and muscle enable us to move, in work and at play.